We're sitting along the shores of the Connecticut River in South Windsor, Connecticut. It's, uh, it's a beautiful river, a uh, very tranquil spot, probably like this hundreds of years ago and before Europeans came. And uh, being in a place like this makes you want to go out in the river and, and take a trip on it. Uh, of course, before you do that, you need a water conveyance, a boat of some kind, and there are many possibilities. And one possibility is the one I'm sitting on right here. This is a giant log, approximately 13 feet long, over a foot and a half in diameter, and with the proper techniques and uh, perseverance, it could be turned into a dugout canoe. There have been quite a few modern recreations, very successful, of people trying to build dugouts uh, these days with logs using Stone Age tools. However, each, each uh, project that I know of started out by chainsawing the tree down and then towing it home in a tow truck. And we've done something very different here. Uh, this particular tree was actually growing in this hollow spot, which no longer exists. Its roots were here, and it toppled over as the bank was undercut during a spring flood, probably four years ago. And it toppled into the water, and part of it is still lying down here. It's the closest log here. And a little further out, probably out of view, are the roots of the tree. They've been thrown there by this year's spring flood. And the only way that one can cut through a huge log like this with Stone Age technology is to burn through the log. And you can see there two burns were made. I did this last year. And this particular burn is quite easy to make. You heap wet sand mud and clay up over the log to protect it and then start a fire under it and on top of it. And probably 10 or so hours later, 12, who cares, it's finally cut through. Uh, one of the problems a canoe maker has, of course, is trying to get this nice curved shape in the stern, this is the back end, and also in the bow. And the shape in the bow is even nicer. I pondered how to do this with stone tools, and after I got through burning, I realized that a log naturally burns to a rounded, blunt shape with burning. So already we've shaped both ends of the dugout canoe quite naturally just by burning it through. Now the next part will consist of attempting to flatten the bottom area, and we've got some log rollers and some pullings and other things like this. And we've already done some chipping in the bottom. We want to get this quite flat because a round bottom boat will tend to turn it. And first we should talk about the kind of tools we're going to use. This will be done strictly with stone tools. And in my pack here I've got several. I guess the most obvious one to anyone who thinks about it is the axe. And I have two types of axes here. Perhaps we can get a, a close-up of some of these. The smaller one is called a grooved axe, and right here where the handle is, there is actually a groove underneath here. You can't see it because the handle is actually gripping the axe there. And even though it rocks a little, that is held quite tightly. And it's up the chipping some pretty good wood. The kind of axe I prefer for this type of work 
is called a celt by the archaeologists. It's unfortunate that they have so many names, but we should know about that. It's really an axe also. It has a tapered head, and it's fitted into a hole in the handle. And with each blow, it's actually driven in a little more tightly. So the axes will come in handy. They will be important tools eventually. But for chopping a long surface like this flat and controlling it, there's another kind of tool which is much more important. This is called an adz, A-D-Z. It also is an axe. But the important difference is that the axe has its blade in line with the handle. The adz has it turned at a right angle. And you'll see how useful this is when I do a little chopping. And it's very easy to aim the adz along where you're cutting. You don't have to think much about it. And you can see that stone tools are no joke if they're properly made and used. Chips like this fly away. And it'll probably take two to three hours work to flatten the bottom of this dugout, which is not a bad investment for a boat that will last for a very long time. I made one other tool just because I wasn't sure how to smoothen out the marks of the ads. You'll notice the ad leaves quite a few choppy marks. And Perhaps if we think of a steel adze, we might suggest that, well, this might leave a smoother surface. But when I think of the old barns with the beams made in the 17 and 1800s, they have choppy surfaces like this. So I also made an additional tool. I don't know what you could call it, a large chisel or a gouge. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, but I've been doing some experimenting. And let me show you what I've, what I've done so far. This is a hammer, I guess you could call it. It's just a convenient piece of wood. And here's how I learned to use this tool. Now, I'm going to try and smooth out this surface that I've already chopped with the ads. I'm supporting it with my wrist here and my leg here. And I'm guiding it, just hammering it along. And I get quite a bit of control. surface is quite smooth. So there are many questions that are unanswered, and that's part of the beauty of this project, is try to answer some of the questions. How does one use stone tools to make a dugout canoe? Many of the books say that the Indians scrape the surface clean with shells. When I scrape with shells, all that happens is I wear the wood a little and the shell wears down. I don't get any results. So I suspect a tool like this might have been the answer. So we have our three tools. The axe, the adze, and the sort of gouge. And with those three tools, we'll shape the bottom of the canoe. There are about two or three inches of wood to remove and flatten it. And then when we're through shaping the bottom, then the real serious work Our log hasn't turned into a dugout canoe yet, but a great deal has been accomplished. Uh, right now, it looks kind of grimy and muddy, and that's just what you're looking at. You're looking at mud on the ends and on some of the flattened areas. And as I've mentioned already, this is an experiment to answer many questions about how to do this kind of work. Even though I've worked with stone tools and built many, many things for a long time, I have a lot of unanswered questions, and one of the biggest revolves around moisture that's inside a log. And as we chop away at the surfaces, we're exposing the wetter parts of the log inside, and the log wants to dry. And each afternoon or evening when I finish working, I plaster mud on the areas that I've cut into so that I don't dry it too fast and cause it to crack. You can see that we've rounded the ends quite a bit, and we'll clean the mud off and do some work on them. And there's another crucial piece of work that we've completed also. We've actually flattened the area that will soon be the bottom. As I'm planning on shaping the outside of the canoe first before we start hollowing the inside. 
and I was lucky enough to get this log on a couple of rollers and position it so that I can actually turn it myself, even though it probably weighs over a thousand or fifteen hundred pounds. And let's take a look at the bottom and see how much work we've done. There we are. This will be the bottom of the canoe, and as you can see, with only a couple hours of ads work, we were able to flatten it out. And of course, this is necessary so that the boat won't tip when someone sits in it and rocks it a little. And I was lucky on this log because one side of the tree was actually quite flattened. If it had been a perfectly round tree, I'd have had to spend maybe two more hours flattening. But there's only one bottom. The flattening only has to be done once. So it's not a tremendous job. So that's easy. I see no cracks on this side, so I haven't plastered it with mud. If any start to develop, I'll do exactly that. All right, now let's go to a more difficult project, shaping the ends of the canoe. I'll roll it back because it gives me a better working angle from where I'll be working on the log. All right, and we'll go to one end, scrape off some of the mud, and we'll take a look at some of the problems and some of the solutions. I mentioned earlier that burning the ends helps shape them to kind of a bullet shape, which is the very shape of the ends of the dugout when it's finished. However, you pay a price for using fire, and it has to do with moisture again. As the fire burns, of course, it's very hot and also dries the log, and you can see these cracks here. Quite a few of them. A larger one there. And even though the shape is nearly correct, it's necessary to cut back a couple of inches of wood with the adds and actually cut off those cracks. So the fire removed most of the bulk wood, but we still have to cut past it. And otherwise, we'll have cracks in the end of our canoe, and that would be an unacceptable source. You can see I've already cut quite a bit with the adds here. All right. And here's what I found, a very interesting thing. The outside of this log, since it's been lying partly out of the water for three years nearly, kind of crushes with the adds when I strike it here. But once I get into the inner wood, which is wetter, then it cuts very cleanly, and that's important. And one of my questions was, how close to the grain can I cut with the adds? I was able to take cuts along the grain like this quite easily, but as I got closer and closer and closer, I found that the adds cut in very nicely. And we'll see that on the other end. We have to take a look at that now, because that has a much bigger problem we need to solve. This is the front, or what I intend to be the bow end of the canoe, and this particular log, unknown to me at the time when I decided to build a dugout of it, has suffered from a thing that loggers and foresters call wind shake, and that's just what it sounds like. As this tree stood on the high bank above us, it was buffeted all winter by the west winds, and it actually shook and it opened up a groove inside the living tree itself from the, sh from the continuous shaking of the wind. And when I discovered this, I realized that this could not be part of the canoe. At first I thought it was just a shallow crack, but as you can see, the way I'm sticking this twig in, the wind shake goes in probably a couple of feet. That's a foot right there, and I realized that even though I had my own plans for this log, this log was beginning to tell me what side would be up and what side would be down. And this side has to be up and all of this material eventually removed if we're going to make a successful canoe out of it. So in a way, the log is dictating what it will be when it's a finished canoe for me. And frankly, I don't mind that too much, even though it's made a little more work for me. I'll roll the log back now, and we'll see how work on this end has progressed. Here is the other side of that wind-shaked end. Now, as we've mentioned, the wind shake insists that this be the top of the canoe. This will be the bottom, and here's the bow being shaped. 
We also saw how we have to get rid of the cracked material. And notice how the burn up in this area has done us a big favor. I hardly need to remove anything there. It's good solid wood under there because the fire has moved with the grain. But as we cross the grain, the cracks developed as we saw on the other end. And a question I needed to answer is how tightly will my ads bite into the wood as it crosses the grain? And as you can see, it's completely capable of chopping almost at a 45 degree angle here. All right, we're at about 60 degrees. It's still cutting the wood very cleanly as long as the wood is wet. The entire log, the entire log is wet in the inside, and as I'm chopping, I can feel moisture from the log spurting out and actually hitting my skin, even though the log has lain here for several years. I'm getting closer and closer. Now, I'm almost on top of the grain. And especially down here, when I'm cutting at a right angle to the grain, this tool does not work as well as I would like. And I'm taking the chance of smashing out pieces. So I brought another tool today, which looks just like a big knife. And that's exactly what it is. These were the kind of knives that uh, primitive peoples made all the time. And if they had them available for other use, they certainly would have used them for a dugout. Now, unlike our usual jackknife, this has an edge that weaves back and forth. That's due from the process by which it was manufactured, of removing small chips. And this is called a serrated edge, very much like the steak knives we have at home. And I'm going to sharpen it just the slightest bit with an antler here. I crack off a few small pieces. And that's why it turns out serrated, because these small pieces are removed. It gives a weaving edge. So in use, this will not seem like our usual knife. It will seem like a saw. And that's exactly what I'm going to do when I get very close to the edge. Is very sharp. I'll do some sawing with it, just to make sure I don't split the edges, because these cracks from the fire, as you can see, are still very close. Yes, and that wood is looking very solid under there. It's still very wet, which is an advantage. That means it's not ready to dry out and crack. Now, unlike our modern saws, a stone saw will not saw 